So I'm Todd Gamblin. I'm from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Um, and I guess I'm going to talk about SPAC, um, which is a tool that I developed. But I, I think more broadly, I'm going to talk about um, building things. And, and that's, that's what SPAC is about. Um, my background is uh, I used to work as a, as a web developer before I got into HPC. I, I did web development for about a year. I think that gave me an appreciation of automating things. Um, but then I decided I wanted to do uh, you know, something I thought was more exciting, so I went back to grad school and got into HPC. Um, my research is about performance tools and about using machine learning to tune and, and to analyze the performance of HPC code. So this talk isn't really related to what I thought my research directions were going to be. Um, it's about build systems, um, which you know you may be surprised to know that the build systems are really interesting. So I think if I if I convince you of maybe two things by the end of this talk, it's that build systems are at least more interesting than you thought they were, um, and second uh, that you know this is a an important problem. Um, so let's talk about software a little bit. Um, scientific software is really complex. Um, how many people have actually looked at all the dependencies of, of the codes that they use on, say, the supercomputers? Who's, who's examined all that? Raise your hand. OK, so not that many people. So, some of the, the people I expected. Um, if you look at something like, say, let's take Nalu. Um, this is an unstructured, massively parallel, low mock flow code. Um, and I guess the, the code itself is over here um, on, the, on the left. Um, the rest of that stuff is all dependency libraries that that code builds on. So I think for, for most production HPC codes, um, people are not building these things themselves entirely. They're building the application, but they're standing you know, on the shoulders of giants, if you will, um, by using all these other dependency libraries. Um, that's a relatively small one. Let's look at deal two. This is a C++ finite element library. Um, it's, it, the library, again, is the thing on, it's the leftmost thing. Um, all the rest of that is dependency libraries for doing things like solving equations uh, and, and other stuff. Um, and then if you look in, in the interpreted language space, um, things get even more tricky. So here's um, an R data mining package, which you know, has more dependencies than both of those things combined. Um, the thing in the middle there is R. Um, the stuff to the left of it is all things written in R, and the stuff to the right of it is all the stuff that R needs to run. Um, so who's ever built something like this? Anyone? Yeah? OK, some people. Um, it's, it's pretty painful. Um, even our proprietary codes are based on lots of open source libraries and can be a pain to build. Um, this is Ares. It's a production multi-physics code from Lawrence Livermore. Um, all the stuff in blue up there is open source libraries that Ares depends on. So that's things like Python. It's, it's whatever MPI implementation you're using. It's HDF5. It's all external stuff. Um, the, the red, green, and yellow, those are all packages that are developed at Livermore for one reason or another. Um, and they're basically pieces that implement different physics um, in this one code, Aries, which you see at the top. Um, but managing a code like this, this can be a, a giant pain. Um, and if we look at the Exascale computing project, um, which is trying to build the software ecosystem for Exascale machines, things get even more complicated. Um, they want to build 15 plus applications, each of which might be as big as some of the ones I just showed. They want to build 80 software packages. They want to target five-ish architectures and platforms, um, or you know, maybe some of them for different, for different codes. Um, up to seven different compilers, um, 10 programming models, and maybe two or three versions of each package, because certain versions of some packages are not compatible with other versions of other packages. So you need to build multiple of them to make sure that this whole stack gets working. And so if you multiply that all out, that's like up to 1.2 million different combinations of, of builds uh, that you can do uh, for all that software. Um, but nobody wants to build all that, uh, and, and nobody should. Um, every application has its own stack of dependencies. It wants to build a specific set of these. Um, and, and people currently, or at least a lot of, in a lot of places, um, people dedicate all kinds of time to making sure these things are built and installed properly on HPC machines. So there are teams of people at the different facilities who, whose job is just to install software um, and to help users with, with the installed software. Um, and you know, often, uh, you trade reuse and usability for performance, because once you get this thing built, um, you, know, you don't really want to go build it again. It works, so it's good enough. We'll, we'll get the performance that we get. It's not worth it to spend more time on. So there has to be some better way to rely on other people's software um, than, than just building this stuff by hand. And so to give you an idea of how painful that is, um, here's, this is 
how it was to build software on my Mac laptop in around 2013 uh, when I started this, this back project. So if I wanted to install some library, I would just get on my Mac, and I had Mac ports installed, and I would say port install that thing. And then the thing would run, it would go grab all the dependencies it needs, and it would finish. And I would have that thing that I wanted. And all I had to do was name it. Um, if I wanted to install things on a supercomputer, um, what I'm stuck doing is I have to download all the tarballs that I need, I have to know where they all come from, go and find all the packages, read all the specs for all the software, figure out what it depends on. Um, and I have to start building all that stuff from scratch. Um, maybe some of it's installed on the machine, um, but maybe it's not in the configuration I want. Maybe the facility built it for an old version of the compiler, or maybe um, it's just not compatible with what I want to build for some reason or another. Um, so this is what that looked like. Um, you go and configure, you go and make, you'd fight with the compiler, make, tweak, configure some more, go and do CMake, do GMake. Um, and finally, once that's done, you'd go and say, oh good, I, I got this thing to link, I'll run the code, and then it seg faults. And <laughs> you start over. Um, so, you know, that, that's, this, is not, this is not an ideal process. Um, so what you really want to do uh, is, is have something install these things for you. Um, so what about modules? Who's heard of modules? Who's used modules on HPC machines? Yeah, okay, so everyone knows modules. Um, most machines will have some kind of environment module system. So Tickle modules goes back to like 1995. Um, and there's a newer version of that um, called LMOD from TAC that, where the modules are written in Lua or Tickle um, that's, that's maintained now and, and much more robust. Um, and those tend to be the most popular things. Um, but with modules, you know, if you don't have a command, like say GCC, if for some reason you don't have that, you run it, it says command not found. You can usually just say module load, whatever version you want, um, and then you can say, you, you can run the command again, and it works. You have that thing. Um, and so when I first started this project, people said, well, you know, what, what about modules? Doesn't this just solve the same problem that modules does? Well, modules don't actually handle the installation process. Behind all of these wonderful modules that you use, there's that whole team of facilities people who have painstakingly set all these things up made sure they work, um, written the module files sometimes by hand, um, and put them on the system for users to make it easy for you guys to use software. Um, and so, you know, you can only module load the things that they've installed. Um, and if you want to do something slightly different, um, then, then you're kind of out of luck. So in, um, you know, the mainstream world, people use package managers for this. Who has used a package manager? Yeah, okay, some people have. Who has used RPM or YUM or APT? Yeah, okay, those are package managers. Um, and what those things do um, is they, they're not a replacement for your build system. Um, they don't replace CMake or AutoTools or your make files. Um, but they do sit on top of those things and they manage the relationships or the dependencies between packages. And so, um, you know, determining the magic configure line um, for every package in you know, a 47 or 90 package uh, graph it, it takes time and a lot of effort, and you have to make sure that it's you know, configured right. Um, and, and so package managers are a way to package up the, the work of other people so that you can use them. Um, and so, I mean, you can think of it in, in three levels, I guess. Um, there's low-level build systems like Make that sort of manage the relationships between object files and, and source files in one program. Um, above that, there's high-level build systems like CMake and AutoTools, which you know, I think grew out of the need for some cross-platform way to do shared libraries, um, and then grew from there, and also some simplification of, of the makefile syntax. Um, generally, those things just generate makefiles from some higher level language. Package managers sit on top of that stuff, and they either drive the build, or they, they manage metadata about the relationships between um, binary packages, and, and they handle Basically, if you install one package, what does it need? What else do I need to install to get that thing installed? So um, that's what we're talking about here. So why didn't this stuff catch on in HPC? Um, and why don't you just have a package manager when you log into um, your, your HPC machines? Um, you, you probably do, um, but it's probably the system package manager. And so with things like RPM, YUM, ABT, all of the things that manage the system packages, they usually require root to run. Um, and you don't get root on supercomputers because they're shared machines and, and the admins don't want you to screw up um, what's, what's on the system. Um, 
And you know, there's good reason for that. Um, we isolate the users so that they can share the machine effectively. These are unique machines. Um, you don't want to have everyone reconfiguring the supercomputer. Um, you wouldn't get predictable results or performance that way. Um, but the other problem with these things is even if you could use them, um, most of the traditional package managers, they manage one stack. So RPM, yum, all those things, um, they're managing the packages that are installed on your system in directories like slash user. Um, it's basically one prefix that contains a whole bunch of libraries. They have to be consistent, um, and you know, all the headers in there have to be consistent. You can't have conflicts. And the people who build these Linux distros um, that the package managers are a part of, they ensure that all that stuff uh, works well. Um, and they support things like you know, seamless upgrades. If you want to upgrade to the new version of an operating system, you can usually say, you know, yum, upgrade this package. Um, and it will go and figure out what it needs to do, what needs to be uninstalled, what needs to be installed to make sure that the whole system is consistent afterwards. Um, there are things called port systems um, that are similar to package managers. Um, so things like BSD ports, Mac ports. Who's heard of Homebrew? Who used Homebrew on their Mac? Yeah, I thought that you'd get a lot of people there. Um, those are all port systems. Um, they kind of do the same thing that your system package manager does, but one nice thing is things like Homebrew don't necessarily require root, but they're still managing one stack. Um, and they don't let you fetch things like prior versions of all the packages. Um, they're, they're not as flexible um, as what we like to do in HPC. Um, and the other thing about most of these systems is that they build lowest common denominator uh, kind of binaries. Um, so you're not really getting the optimization out of the machine that you want uh, for HPC. You're just you're building something with like dash G dash O2 so that it's maximally compatible across all the systems that the users would want to use. But these things aren't geared for um, doing the kind of experimentation that we do in HPC. So I would say most of the system package managers are geared, um, at least at the moment, to the low-level system stack. So you deploy the, you know, the underlying OS on the cluster. But then the user space stuff, all the stuff from MPI up um, in, the, in the math libraries and things, um, that gets either built by hand or they use an HPC uh, build tool like I'm going to talk about. So in 2013, um, after many sessions at, at the terminal with segfaults and, and builds, um, partially driven by the fact that I had a, had a grad student at the time, um, and I had to rebuild uh, their stack uh, constantly. They had about 10 different libraries they depended on. That included like Boost and Seagal and a bunch of complicated things. Um, and every time the, the system's OS changed, we had to recompile all that stuff. Um, and so it got to be very frustrating. Um, we also want to help the facilities um, who spend all this time uh, building things. They, like I said, they build a fairly small uh, set of you know, maximally useful software for all their users, but they don't build everything. Um, and, and that stuff can quickly go out of date and not be compatible with what the users want to run. Um, and then you know, we want to help app teams who spend a lot of time building their applications on top of systems. And oftentimes, they will have to rebuild a lot of the system stuff, too. Um, my other motivation for doing this um, was it's hard to distribute performance tools. So I, I come from a performance tool background. Like I said, we build things that go and measure the performance of programs. Um, the idea is that you go and you know, the user magically downloads your performance tool from the internet. Uh, they build it on their system. They run it, and it runs out of the box on their application, and everything works. They know where the performance problem is, and they fix it. What usually happened with performance tools is that users would download our performance tools, and they would try to build them, and then they would come back to us and say, well, we didn't need performance quite that badly. <laughs> Um, and so the stuff wasn't getting used, and I wanted to make a way uh, for people to do that. Um, the, the tricky part was satisfying all the requirements that HPC people have, um, because I think, I don't know, HPC people tend to want control over everything because they want to get uh, performance, so you, you don't want to give up that. Um, there's a broad set of people in HPC. I think the roles are very different from what you see in industry, so like in the cloud, um, you can usually assume that the developer has control of their own node. They can run the system package manager. It's fine. They're administering a service or something. Um, in HPC, like I said, you're, you're sharing a machine. And so you have to target users um, who just want to run codes. You have to target admins who are you know, deploying software on the system. Um, and also developers, if you want to include everyone and get, get everyone involved in this, in this effort. Um, it has to be easy to use. Um, it can't be as tedious as actually building the software. Um, and it has to be easy to contribute. So you, you, we need to leverage you know, what, what everyone can do. If someone builds a code on a particular machine, there should be a way for them to share that with everyone else who might need to build that code on that machine. Um, and then, um, like I said, we want to be able to experiment. We want to build lots of different versions of software. We want to try to build a version that's, that gets the best performance on a system. Um, and that can be hard. So what we came up with um, was SPAC. 
So SPAC's available now. Um, it's a package manager for HPC. Um, it runs in your home directory. You can go and clone it, um, and you can use it to deploy software for a facility. Um, app teams use it to manage their stacks, um, and you can even use it to just install programs for yourself. So if you want to build something hard, like Trilinos or HDF5, um, then you can go grab SPAC and try SPAC install that thing. Um, and it knows uh, for those packages where they live on the internet, where to go download the tarballs. It knows what to expect. It has a checksum for the tarballs so that you download the tarball that you know, we intended you to. Um, you don't get a malicious one necessarily. Um, you can build with different compilers and swap them in and out of builds. Um, and in general, we're just trying to provide flexibility while also making it very easy to go and install um, different packages. So here's what that looks like. Um, if you use SPAC, um, you basically, we, we want it in the most general case to work like a regular package manager. You could just say SPAC install, say MPI leaks is a tool that we developed for tracking MPI handles like MPI, um, uh, if you do an MPI receive, you get a handle and you can go and wait on that. Um, and, and so you can install uh, MPI leaks, it, tra it tracks leaks. Um, and if you just want that, this will go and install you the basic version of that tool um, and it, it'll just give you some sensible defaults. If you want to install a specific version of MPI leaks, we have a syntax for that. So you can say install MPI leaks at version 3.3. You can say build MPI leaks at version 3.3 with a particular compiler. So that's with percent %GCC or percent %GCC at version. You could put Intel in there. You could put other compilers if it can find them on your system. Um, you can have build options exposed to the user from your package. So you can say this package supports a thread option. You can build it with or without threads, and then that can be specified on the command line. Um, and then you can do things like inject C flags into the build. So if you want to do special optimizations, we can go and inject that into all the packages that you build in a stack and let you build different versions of that for different flag combinations. Um, we try to handle cross compilation, and we're, we're working on doing a better job of that. Um, and then finally, this whole syntax is recursive. So if you want to specify detailed things about your dependencies, you can basically just write on the command line the constraints that you want um, and, and not more, and then SPAC will go and fill in the defaults for you. Um, and, and we'll come back to that. So from a user perspective, um, that's the command line syntax for installing. If you want to see what's available, you can just type SPAC list, um, and then you'll get a list um, that's a lot longer than this now. Um, when I made this slide, we had 300 packages. We have over 2,800 uh, now. And um, when you want to see what's actually installed, um, and I guess one thing to note here is that these are just names of packages. So for everything that you want to build, there's just one name that you need to know. Um, and and that's, it's not that that's a specific build. That's a template so that you can do all these different builds using the syntax I described. Um, if you want to know what's installed, you can say SPAC find, and it'll list out um, all the different packages that you've installed along with their versions. Um, and this is sort of a high-level view. Um, you may notice that like Dynast up there um, and AdeptUtils, some of these packages, there are, there are duplicate versions of them. Um, those aren't actually duplicates, they're just different configurations of the same package. This view just doesn't show all the details. Um, and so if you want to zoom in on that, um, you can go and say, you know, stack find call path. It shows you all the things that, that are called call path. Those are two identical versions, um, but compiled with different compilers. Um, and if you wanted to zoom in on that some more, um, you could look at, you know, you could tell it to show you all the dependencies and how they're built. Um, and you could see, for example, that these two are built with different versions of boost. And if you tried to use them with each other, um, they may be binary incompatible. And so, um, but we allow these to coexist on the system. We don't require you to have a consistent version of boost across all your packages. Um, so, one of the goals of the project was to make it easy for HPC people um, to write packages and to contribute to the system. And so, um, you know, there, there are package managers like this. So Homebrew has very similar packages to SPAC because we based our packages on Homebrew. Um, but Homebrew is written in Ruby. And there's not a lot of uptake um, for Ruby in HPC. Um, so we said, you know, we got to write this in something that people will actually pick up and, and use. So we went and, and basically implemented a DSL of our own in Python. And so every package in SPAC is just a class um, that has the name of the thing that you want to install. So this one's called Dynast. It's got some metadata on there. Um, so it says, you know, this is, a, this is an API for dynamic binary instrumentation. It's a library that does that. Um, it's got a home page. It has a URL where you can download it, and it has a bunch of versions there, along with their checksums, uh, so that you can go and download those different versions of Dynast. 
Um, it's smart enough that you know, for some packages, it can extrapolate the URL um, from you know, the, the one URL at the top for all those different versions. Um, you can override on a per version basis if your package has weird URLs that don't make sense that we can't extrapolate. Um, and then finally, it's got dependencies. Um, and so that's probably the most important thing here. It says if you build this package, you have to build all these things first. And you have to build them this way. So if you see here, um, it says I need CMake for building. I need to link against these two other libraries. And then I need Boost as well. Um, and I need it at version 1.4.2 or higher. And I need it with the multi-threading option. So you can actually depend on build options in SPAC. And if two packages depend on conflicting build options, we'll just build them both um, in, in most cases. Um, and then at the bottom there, that's just the install method. And for the most part, that's supposed to look like shell. Um, it's Python. It's using Python functions, but they're supposed to work like shell commands. So you can see it just says, with this working directory, it's going to create that run CMake with some options, um, and then make and make install. Um, and the kind of cool thing here is that um, in this install method, you're guaranteed that all those dependencies got built first, and that spec object that we pass in tells you all the details about them. So you can say, hey, spec, what's the prefix of boost? Um, where do I tell this build to find boost? That's all done for you. So you don't have to do things like say, where is boost installed on this system? I have to find boost. Where is this other dependency installed on the system? I have to check all these locations for it. Uh, we've already done that. We've installed it. And we just tell you where they are. So your job is translate that stuff into build instructions. And that's it. So um, we make sure that all these things can coexist by installing them in kind of weird directories. Um, we have a hashing scheme. So basically, in SPAC, one version, it's, it's not just the version of the package. It's the entire graph. So if you can imagine that graph with all the metadata on it about compilers and build options and versions and things, we make a description of that, we hash that, and we use that hash to figure out where that thing should go in the file system. And so everything that we install goes in its own directory. So you could have you know, n versions of a thing for n different sets of compiler flags if you want to experiment with that. Um, the other thing that we do to make that manageable um, is we embed these things called R paths in the binary. Um, and this is based on the way that Livermore has built stuff for a while. But basically, it means that that library knows where to find its dependencies. If you run it, you don't have to set LD library path uh, in your environment or anything. The library just has the paths of its dependencies embedded so it can find where they, where they live. And the thing will just work if you run it out of the directory. Um, and we added a few more things um, like interfaces for things like MPI. Um, in SPAC, you don't depend on, say, um, you, you, you don't depend on mpitch, and you don't depend on open MPI. You can if you, if you really have to be specific. Um, but you, depend, you can depend on MPI, which is an interface, not a package. Um, it's not an implementation. And the packages that provide MPI just say that in their package file. So up here, you can see MPI leaks depends on MPI at version 2. So that's the MPI 2 standard or higher. Um, and then the packages that actually implement MPI say what version of MPI they provide when they're at different versions. Um, and so if your package requires a particular version of MPI, we'll find a provider that supplies that version for you and match it up. Um, and so all that kind of stuff is done with something that we call concretization. Um, concretization is basically it's what fills in the missing parts of the spec. If I say on the command line, install MPI leaks at call path version 1.0 plus the debug option with libelf at this version. That makes an abstract spec. It's not complete. It doesn't tell me how to build that package. It tells me some constraints on how it should be solved or how it should be installed. Um, and then we go and do something called concretization where we take that um, and we make it into a complete graph um, that contains the compiler and the compiler version that you're going to build it with. It contains the architecture. It contains all the values for the different variants that go on the package. Um, and then the cool thing about that is um, that when you do this, basically SPAC guarantees you that in your install method in your package um, that you're past a complete description of how to build the package. So like I said, you don't have to go and check whether things are installed on the system. SPAC just knows and it tells you. Um, and, and so all the things are set. And, and I think that that was one of the things that I, we saw that our users were struggling with when they would write build scripts and try to reuse them in different places. The way that you would search for MPI at one site is different from the way that you would search for MPI at another. So we try to take that burden off the programmers and just give you um, what you're supposed to build. Um, so there's one nit uh, in this whole problem, which is that this algorithm here is NP-complete. So, um, it turns out that if you have a bunch of packages and dependencies, and say you have A, it depends on B and C. And then B and C both depend on D, but they depend on different versions of D. You can't put those in the same graph. 
Um, and so this is a problem that all package managers have to, or well, most package managers have to deal with in some way. Some don't. Some just punt on this. Um, but essentially, there are certain configurations you can't build. And so based on the metadata, the package manager should go and try to find you a consistent graph. Um, we've implemented that. Uh, our algorithm is currently greedy, and we're working on improving it. Um, and, and we're working on solving this for sort of a more general case where we're not just solving it for packages and versions. Uh, we're also solving it for all those build options, the compiler information, things like ABI compatibility, and all sorts of complicated things that arise in HPC. Um, and it turns out that stuff is pretty interesting. Um, I have a whole other talk on that, but I, I decided to spare you the details for the, for the dinner talk. Um, so we built this. It's available. Um, you can go and download SPAC, uh, go to SPAC.io, um, and try it out. Um, and, and one cool thing about this is that you know, we, we tried to think about all the different users that we could target. Um, and because we actually tried to build a community around this, um, you know, I think the, the contributions have actually taken off. We, we didn't expect this, uh, but it, it happened. Um, so we gave a presentation at SC15 on SPAC, um, and then we started seeing, you can see up to that point from 2013 to around 2015, November, um, SPAC was pretty much a single organization project. It was just me kind of and some other folks poking around at Livermore, um, building packages for stuff that we wanted to, um, to make portable. Um, and so after that, we started seeing contributions from other folks. Um, and at this point in, in 2018, I think you know, Livermore contributions to SPAC are less than 20% of the total packages. And we get all of our contributions from lots of other organizations. Um, the core is still, there's a lot of Livermore contributions in the core. Um, and, you know, that, but it's grown. I mean, we're only slightly more than half now. Um, and so we actually have people who are helping us out, even on like the core tool itself, the, the, you know, the, the thing that does the builds and not just the packages and the recipes. Um, and for the documentation, um, that's what the, the contribution graph in the, in the lower right there is. We actually get contributions um, for documentation from people outside the lab um, who, who have helped us with this thing. Um, and, and I think that's been really, really helpful um, because we get a lot of insight into you know, what's, what's wrong with SPAC, what can we improve, um, what's missing in the documentation, and people will just go and do it. Um, it's a pretty busy project, so if you look at the contributions on GitHub, say, for the past um, month, we've had 161 pull requests merged in a month. Um, that's a lot of stuff um, that's going on. We have a lot of different contributors um, pushing into the repo um, at any given time, um, and a lot of issues, although I guess, I guess for this month we actually closed more than were open, so that's good. Um, it's used worldwide. I did some stats on the documentation page for SPAC. Um, these are all the places where, uh, this is the user counts for different cities all over the world for you know, how many users did we see access our documentation page from these places. Um, Google says that it's like 7,800 unique users. I think that like includes your iPhone, your browser, your other browser, and, and other things like that. So I think that's an overstatement. Um, but at least this shows that you know, we're getting constant interest um, and that people are actually um, you know, using this thing um, and reading the docs. And people download this four or 500 times a day. I think most of that is continuous integration, so I don't actually know how many you know, actual people download it for their personal use. I think that's automated builds of things. Um, but still, that's pretty cool. Um, it's gotten to where it's used on many of the top HPC systems. So uh, SPAC is used to deploy on Summit. Um, I, got, I got to go see Summit at Oak Ridge, and I asked them if I could put a SPAC sticker on it, and they did not let me do that. <laughs> um, they did let me stand next to all the signatures, so I, but I was not able to put a SPAC sticker over any of them. Um, it's used at you know, NERSC, Livermore, Argonne, um, other USDOE sites. Um, EPFL is a major contributor. They built the module support in SPAC, so module file generation and things like that. Um, Shanghai Jiao Tong University in China is using SPAC uh, to deploy their Pi system. Um, and even outside of HPC proper, I guess, um, there are people in the high energy physics communities who are contributing and actually have contributed some, some major features like binary packaging um, so that we can do build caches um, and, and some other things. Um, and then within ECP, um, ECP is being used uh, as the software release process for SPAC. Um, and I think this is really, this is pretty cool. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm psyched to see them doing this because um, this allows us to have basically a definition of what, what does it mean to be done? Uh, what does it mean for something to be deployed and in production? Or at least, you know, it gives us something concrete to say um, th this is in production. Um, before, basically, if you, if you said, okay, we released the latest version of our software, 
Um, you would have to go and sort of test it manually on all these different machines. You'd have to get someone to go and build it there. Um, the build process might be inconsistent. Um, with this, basically, we're, we're making it so that the build is reproducible. You've got it packaged up into a spec package, and we guarantee that you can go and, and build it with certain configuration options on different machines. And so we're trying to automate that process more uh, than it was before. The other kind of cool thing about this, um, and this is sort of, this is pioneered by Mike Haru and Lois Kerfman McInnes um, on the XSDK project, is the ECP is starting these SDK teams um, where basically groups of people with related software get together and they do regular releases and they do regular builds to ensure that all their stuff can work together. Um, and there was tons of work done on the solver stack. Um, so if you look at this dependency graph here for XSDK, it's got Trailinos, uh, Petsy, Hyper, SuperLU, lots of packages that you probably know about. Um, it wasn't originally possible to build all of those and, and, and link them in the same application because they would have symbol conflicts and things like that. But automating this process and also just doing a lot of hard work on the libraries, um, these guys were able to get this thing building. And now they release the thing on a regular basis through SPAC. Um, and, and this is what it looks like. Um, so now you can go and say SPAC install XSDK and get all of these things at once. Or you can just depend on individual packages and use them in your code if you were to package something up for SPAC. So all of this is, is fairly, um, you know, this, this is all technical. Um, but I think one of the things about SPAC that's really nice is that we were able to build this community around it. Um, and so I think that's something that's, a, that's pretty important to think about um, as, you're, as you're building HPC software, um, is that, you know, you're not, it, just building it for you is, is kind of missing the, the point of computers. Like, because basically they're, they're machines that people built um, to automate things. And, and yeah, that's good for, for research, but if you want your research to be used by other people, um, and if you want your code to be used by other people, um, you, know, you need to, to build a community out of it and make it so that other people actually want to use it. Um, and so you know, I think it's mostly luck that we were able to do this, um, but one of the things that we did do consciously from the start was we tried to lower the barriers for people who wanted to use our software. Um, so one thing we did was we used GitHub. Um, GitHub is really popular. There's other sites like it. It's probably the biggest one. Um, and, it, and people understand how to give you contributions through GitHub. So if you're looking for other people to just drive by and say, oh, hey, I want to fix this thing about this piece of software, um, GitHub is a good place for that because people are, there are a lot of people who are familiar with how to submit a pull request. Um, even if they don't fully understand Git, they know how to submit a pull request. Um, and so you know, it, that's pretty cool. Um, we wrote a lot of documentation, um, and this, is, this was painful, um, but we did it because uh, it, there was, it, not, not because of this study, but um, th there was a recent study by GitHub that showed that you know, the thing that users of open source projects wanted the most was good documentation. Um, and so we, we did this up front, um, and I think it really helped for people to you know, get the impression that we really wanted people to use this software. Like they, so they, they would come by, they were able to find what they needed. We had different guides targeted at different groups of people. So we had like a basic usage guide for people who just wanted to build stuff for themselves. Um, we had a packaging guide for people who wanted to write new recipes. Um, and we had like a reference guide with more complicated stuff. Um, and there are easy ways to do that now. There's free ways in the cloud to go and write the docs in your GitHub repository um, and have them automatically generated on a website. So we use Read the Docs. Um, it actually versions the documentation over time. So if people want to go back to old versions, they can do that. And you don't have to lift a finger to make all that available. Um, you just write the docs, and they're versioned along with your repository. And then they get posted on this page that basically checks them out of your repository and builds them for you. Um, this is pretty interesting. So if you, if you haven't done this um, for your project and, and you do want people to have documentation for it, this is a good way to do it. Um, the other thing that we did um, to scale the project and to get lots of contributors um, is we use continuous integration. So I think there's been some courses or will be some courses at this thing on testing and CI. Um, but pay, pay a lot of attention to that because I think if one of the things that people are scared of is, you know, oh, if I put this out on GitHub, um, I'm going to get tons of pull requests. Um, and then that's more work for me. Um, and, and yeah, it is more work for you, um, but that is someone who found a problem with your thing, or you know, maybe it's someone who did something useless and you can just close the pull request. Um, but you know, if you want to take these contributions from other people, um, you need a way to test them to make sure that they at least are correct before you merge them into your project. And so we have a regression test um, in SPAC uh, that, that, goes, that we check every pull request against. Um, this is run in Travis. Travis is actually free. You can have free uh, tests run on your project in the Google Cloud using Travis. Um, and it's pretty simple to set up. Um, so I would definitely try this out. We've gotten enough uh, pull requests now that we've, we've actually started paying for Travis to get more concurrent builds. 
Um, but for, for most projects, I think the free version is fine. Um, and it's super useful. Um, and I don't think we would ever be able to handle nearly as many contributions to our project if we did not have some kind of CI. It just wouldn't be manageable. We'd have to go and test everything ourselves. Um, so I guess one thing about this is we're only testing the core spec right now, and we do a few builds of packages. Um, but one thing that we really want to do um, is test the actual builds of all the 2800 packages in spec, at least for a few configurations to make sure that they work. Um, so we have a few items on the roadmap that we hope will help with that. Um, we're working on infrastructure for binary distribution, so we basically don't want you to even have to build anything at all. We want to be able to download binaries from the cloud for, for things uh, that, that you build with spec or that you want to install with spec. Um, and we're working on something like environments. Um, so it, who's used virtual end for Conda or something like that? Okay, only a few people. Um, we're we're going to add something like that to SPAC so that you can basically say, here's all the stuff I want in a single unified environment, kind of like your system package manager. Um, but you could have multiple of them. So you could set up an environment for one project. You could set up an environment for another project, install different things in them, and have all of your stacks kind of concurrently managed. Um, and that, that should be in there pretty soon. Um, and then both of these things require new work on, on the concretizer. So that's kind of what we're working on. Um, the CI infrastructure is it's not trivial. So I mean, I think this is one of the harder parts about building communities is that you do have to have some infrastructure and automation for things. Um, and getting people who are competent um, with this kind of stuff is, is hard. So right now, if you think about what someone does when they contribute to SPAC, um, a user would go on GitHub. They'd submit a pull request with a new package um, or, or something. Um, and then we would go and run that through Travis CI and test it. Um, we're adding two things to that, or, or at least we hope to. Um, one is we want to take uh, the source tarballs and basically the, the archives that people are building and go and mirror them somewhere so that if that site goes down, we'll still have the thing available later. Um, and so the builds don't stop when some other website goes down. Um, and then people can just go download them. They would come uh, from the mirror instead of their original source. Um, the other thing that we are adding um, is we're working with GitLab, um, and we're working with Kitware to set up a GitLab for SPAC, where basically we would do CI for SPAC in Amazon um, for all of the different packages. Um, if you just use Travis, uh, you can only do builds that last for 50 minutes, and some of the package builds last for a lot longer than that. Um, so we need more CPU time to do this stuff. So we're starting in the cloud, um, where we can build stuff fairly safely. We don't have to worry about security um, and, and stuff like that. Um, and we would build binary packages and host those in the cloud as well. So then when you say SPAC install foo, if there's a binary package available for that thing for your platform, we'll download that. We won't even have you build it. We'll just have a binary available. Um, that's what we're hoping to do. Um, that takes a lot of work, um, and, and setting that up has been hard. Um, and another thing that we're doing um, is we're working with ECP to try to make continuous integration as easy for HPC systems um, as it is in the cloud. So our, our end goal for this is to actually have CI for HPC where we would take that, those same runs that we do, the builds um, for, the, for the cloud VMs, um, and we would do them at HPC centers um, in the DOE um, and make binary packages for platforms like Cori and you know, Summit and things like that, and basically make it as easy to use the supercomputers as it is to use you know, your, your binary package manager on your desktop. Um, that is a funded project right now. Um, we got six labs together. We talked about what the CI requirements are, um, and we put out an RFP, and we picked a vendor to go and implement this thing. But basically, um, this is a GitLab runner that runs as your user or as a project user on the HPC machines. It's, if you just use GitLab out of the box, it runs all these jobs as you know, the same user. There's no isolation between builds. There's no way to um, enforce things like export control or permissions. Um, and so the centers have been resistant to deploy this kind of thing. Um, but we're trying to add integration both for, the, well, we're trying to add security, um, and we're also trying to add batch integration so that we can actually take advantage of the supercomputers to do some of these builds. Um, and we're hoping to have that out within the next year. Um, and we're going to upstream the changes to GitLab so that other folks can use it. And we want to use this to build binary packages for SPAC for HPC. Um, I talked a little bit about environments. Um, this is becoming a popular model with lots of package managers. I don't want to get too far into the details, but essentially we want to have virtual environments for anything, not just for Python stuff or not just for Ruby stuff. Um, and we want to make that possible with SPAC. Um, and all of those things require additions to our concretization algorithm. And so this is where things get complicated is actually resolving all the dependencies. Um, and so that's, that's an ongoing project. Um, and so if you're interested in this area, 
I guess I'll just put in a plug, um, talk to me, because it's, it's hard to find people who find build systems exciting. Um, and, and so you know, if, you're, if you're interested in working on actually some pretty cool constraint problems, let me know. Um, we may be able to do an internship or something, because um, I think this stuff is pretty cool. Um, so insights from this project, um, you know, I, I'm supposed to have some, some major takeaway uh, from the talk. I think the main thing I would say is don't be afraid to tackle problems that are kind of outside your primary direction. If you're doing a PhD on one thing, um, but there's a meta problem and it's important and could have impact, don't do all the meta problems. Um, then, then don't be afraid to go pursue that. Um, I think, you know, I, I didn't expect to be working on build systems, but it's been pretty rewarding because people actually use this stuff. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's cool to see people installing things more efficiently on machines than they could maybe five years ago. Um, and you know, if you think your project could have impact, um, don't do it just for you. Um, think about the broader use case um, and try to build a community around it. Um, I think one of the things that we had to do for SPAC in order to do that is give up a little bit of control. So you know, we, we aren't the only ones using this. And if we want to get more people um, to contribute to it, we have to build it for more than just our use case. And so you know, there are times when contributors will come along and they'll say, hey, I have this feature. Um, I want to contribute it to SPAC. And it's not exactly what we need. Um, but we still work with them and help them you know, get it in the way that we think it should work. Um, and, and that basically grows us contributors uh, from, from the larger ecosystem who will continue to go and help us build the project, find bugs, make it more robust. Um, and you know, we have to let them take it a little bit in their direction to do that. Um, but that's what a community is. And I think that's the only way uh, you can scale a project if, um, if you have flat budgets. Like, so you know, if, if your project only has so much funding year after year, um, you're not going to get any more manpower out of that funding. Um, but you can go and find common things about your project um, in the area of like, infrastructure or you know, other parts of the project that, you know, that, are, that are shared um, and get more people to contribute to something together. And I think that's really powerful. Um, and then you know, aside from that, I would say um, you know, general open source guidelines, go the extra mile, do the documentation, um, do the continuous integration. You'll, you'll thank yourself later because it'll find bugs for you that you didn't expect. Um, and don't be afraid to put more work in um, if it's going to get you more out. I think um, you know, a lot of these things that we're doing to make this into a community, it does take extra effort. Um, but you get more input from other folks as a result. And I think that's, that's really important. Um, oh, and advertise. We have stickers. So come see me after the talk if you're interested in that. Thanks.